Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Smart Asset. Get your free personalized retirement planning report at smartasset.com slash Apple Insider. And ExpressVPN. Get an extra three months free when you go to expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider. And Remote HQ. Go to remotehq.co slash Apple Insider for a free trial and use the code Apple Insider for three months free. Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Robles, and joining me early in 2021, my friend Wes Hilliard. What's up, Wes? Happy New Year, Stephen. Happy New Year. You know, so many memes talked about how 2021 is going to be so much better than 2020. We're off to a great start. Man, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to comment on all the stuff going on here in America, but the reason why I wanted to touch on it, and the first thing we'll talk about today is I was excited because... Wednesday of this week, as you're listening to this, you know, two days ago, Wednesday, on January 6th, I was actually releasing uh, one of my first video reviews. I was excited to do a video for Apple Insider. It was a review on the Waterfield AirPods Max headphone case. And so the review went live, the video went live, and then all hell broke loose. And it turned into the worst day to do any kind of fun review on an accessory for an Apple product. So Bad day for releases of any kind. Of any kind. And so not commenting on exactly what happened here on America, but to say, you know, if you want to check it out, if you didn't see it, I did review the, the Waterfield AirPods Max headphone case. I really like it. It's a great case. And I did the whole video and the written review about it. So... Just want to check it out and want to talk more about, you know, what it was like editing that in a moment. But you said you saw some other cases on Amazon now for the AirPods Max as well. Yes. Uh, jokingly, <laughs> if you search AirPods Max on Amazon right now, there's some pretty interesting options already out there floating around. You can get bespoke silicon cups to cover your aluminum earpieces no, 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 no. so you can add color <laughs> to your AirPods. Or there are actually a few cases I, I was looking at. I, I might make fun of them, but uh, a couple of them look like they'd be pretty good for 20 bucks. Just your standard, here's your hardback case with a pouch in it, or here's a clone of the Waterfield case kind of thing. But there's some options on there now. So if you really want a case for your AirPods, you, you don't have to spend the $100. But the Waterfield case does look pretty appealing too. Yeah, I'm honest, I'm looking at these cases now. It, some of them look pretty nice, like they would do well. One of the biggest things, is, you know, putting your AirPods Max to sleep, save as much battery as possible. A lot of these cases get around that by making it so you can use Apple's sleeve inside the case, like put your AirPods Max in the sleeve and then put it in the case. And that was one thing I did not want to do. Right. Like if I was going to use a case, I wanted to not have to take them out of the case and then take them out of the sleeve. So the Waterfield case is nice. In the review, I go real close in on this little like butterfly magnet thing. And I'll also put a link in the show notes here. There was a video on YouTube, the guy basically does like fridge magnets and he uses these little magnets and he found where the magnets were on the AirPods Max to have them go to sleep and wake up. And they're on like the back side of each ear cup, kind of like on the lower part of it. And so the Waterfield case has that little butterfly magnet built in. So it puts them to sleep just like the sleeve. And so you can do away with the sleeve. You know, if you were to use one of these Amazon cases without Apple's sleeve, I imagine, you know, they might lose a little battery, but there were some tests too where it's like, they'll lose some battery, but it's not like crazy amount. Like it's not like they're going to be dead overnight if you forget to put them in the sleeve. The only thing I've noticed uh, with AirPods Max, just using them now, I've left them out of the case a couple of times. Most of the time they're in the case and I'm not using it just because I've just gotten used to having them around. But anytime I've left them out of the case, the connection is very sticky. It's not that it's trying to play music because it knows it's not on my head, but I'll see the option appear in my AirPlay menu and sometimes it'll even say connected to AirPods Max. If I'm not using them, I'd rather not have that appear. So that's just, that's definitely, there's definitely a reason to keep Apple's little case thing around. Yeah, for sure. And you know, the, the handoff for AirPods in general with iOS 14 and like the automatic switching between Big Sur and iOS, it works good most of the time, sometimes too good, like touch your AirPods Max over here and then like audio just moves. Uh, you know, which is good when you're wanting to intend it to do it, but it is a little a little sensitive sometimes. But yeah, I, I want them asleep so they don't show up as like an option or it tries to switch to them. Man, they, these things on Amazon though are hilarious. They also have the, those silicon cases I found for the ear cups. Uh, so don't take no offense if you're one of these people, but I feel like those who put like the plastic cases around their Apple Watch are probably the people who also want to put like silicone around the ear pods of the AirPods Max. But that's just me. 
And I mean, silicon gets kind of heavy after, you know, I mean, there's, it looks like these things encase the entire ear cup. So after you put two of these things on, you're adding just even, a, even those a few ounces, but more weight to these already heavy headphones. So I don't, I don't know. They're obviously targeting an SEO tag. They're all saying ear cup replacements, not earpiece covers. So right. yeah, they're just cash grabs, but just kind of funny that they very quickly churn those out to the third party accessory market. Once an Apple product is released it is astounding how fast you know <laughs> all this stuff hits the market you can do the same search now with magsafe on amazon right. and there's um quite the churn of third-party accessories most of them are worthless none of them are really magsafe uh, we saw today anchor uh, released their magsafe clone and just like Satechi, it's a uh, 7.5 watt puck with a gigantic USB-C plug and this is because the 15 watt charging is either too complex or just too uh, expensive for them to do in a cheap puck that's why Apple's is expensive and ships without a charger so it's just kind of confirming what we knew we we thought magsafe was going to be expensive but these guys shipping 20 25 dollar chargers now now, also without charging adapters show us that sure Apple's MagSafe charger is expensive but also for a reason right uh, if if they were spitting out clones with 15 watts and a power brick I'd be a little bit more worried but seems like we're fine here for sure well the reason why I wanted to mention the, the video of course if you haven't checked it out and you're interested in that Waterfield AirPods Max case I encourage you to check it out let me know what you thought about it but it was one of my first video projects doing it solo in a tech Apple centric type way. And as I had recently sold my 16 inch MacBook Pro, my M1 MacBook Pro is kind of my main device now. And so I edited the video on there. It was 4K video at 30 frames per second. You know, I had about 15, 20 minutes of a video plus B roll. I was, you know, doing some color grading and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to say, having now edited that 4K video on the M1, you know, doing the B roll overlays and all that, man, the M1 just performed amazingly. You know, it never choked or slowed down. I don't even remember it dropping frames as I was editing. You know, I was able to cut and, and overlay stuff, super smooth, just performed really well. And then when I exported it, I used compressor on the Mac and exporting whatever that was, like a five minute video, it maybe took three, four, maybe five minutes to export through compressor at like a 20 K bit rate and pretty good quality 4K video. So just really, really impressive. The performance, I didn't hear the fans once. And so, you know, everyone's been praising the M1 for a variety of reasons, battery life and all that. And I still love all those reasons too. But now that I've edited video on it, I really think like this is one of the, one of the best laptops ever. But I am very excited to see what Apple does in the you know, maybe the 14 inch MacBook Pro that might be coming this year, the higher end 16 inch, getting Apple Silicon into those models. I think there's just going to be incredible performance. And so I'm very excited to see that. Yeah. If you follow um, video guy Jonathan Morrison, uh, mm -hmm. he's always been a proponent of Apple Silicon video editing. He got a hold of the iPad Pro early on with the A12 uh, Z processor and uh, showed off that like he could edit and export 4K video faster on the iPad Pro than his. $35,000 Mac Pro kind of thing is just <laughs> right. be all, simply because of optimizations and stuff, but that time is money. While the iPad did perform well, it didn't really have the software to really show up for it. I mean, LumaFusion is a great tool, but we're not dealing with Final Cut on the iPad. Right. Now seeing Apple Silicon perform on a Mac with all the software suite available, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm really hoping, and we'll talk about the rumors in a little bit, but that Final Cut does come to the iPad. You know, I feel like with the Apple Silicon now in the Macs, I feel like the processor that will come to the new iPad Pro will probably be incredible as far as speed and performance. And I think it would be time. You know, maybe they'll do logic first, just given the nature of, you know, audio processing might be a little less processor intensive, but I, I would love to see it. I would love to see Final Cut. It's an obvious next step. I mean, between, between two choices of bring native podcasting and audio controls to the iPad and bring your Pro apps to the iPad, I would almost bet Apple would bring the Pro apps first. Mm. I mean, what else are we talking about here with the iPad improvements? Sure, they can fine-tune everything as they have been, but what's the big next reveal that we're going to see maybe in March or maybe at WWDC? Like, what, what's Apple going to do to continue to push this computer of the future narrative that they've had when 
you know, or are they going to ignore it entirely now that they've got these super powerful MacBooks? It's hard to say. Yeah, that's true. So one other thing I want to touch on, you know, doing a video like that, obviously Andrew O'Hara at Apple Insider, he's been jamming on this for a long time, making incredible videos for Apple Insider. And he understands the solo video gig extremely well, but it just... For those who are wondering, people like MKBHD and some of these other like large channel tech video, like they have teams of people, you know, they have creative teams and creative directors and shooters and all that. And for the other world of tech videos who are guys doing it solo or ladies doing it solo, it is like a different world. And there's some interesting challenges trying to do it by yourself. Uh, I got a Panasonic Lumix S5, which takes great video. And one of the main reasons I got it was because the screen flips out and turns around. Obviously, the main reason is it has great video quality for the price. And after watching many YouTube reviews, you know, a lot of people are saying like, this is uh, incredible picture quality. It's full frame at the price point that it is. But shooting these videos solo is is definitely a challenge. Like you have to think about audio, you have to think about video, how is it framed? And then anytime you want to make an adjustment, like you have to get up <laughs> and like adjust the camera and focus or all that kind of stuff. As I was thinking about that, it's challenging with, you know, a mirrorless or DSLR camera, the, the kind of cameras that, you know, a lot of tech people shoot with. But for those that maybe try to shoot videos with their iPhone, you know, William Gallagher here at Apple Insider, he makes YouTube videos and he uses his iPhones to shoot all that kind of stuff. And he does a great job with that. But this article came out, and I don't know if it was a tweet first or if the Verge article was first, but it was talking about using your Apple Watch as a vlogging monitor for your iPhone. This was a feature on Apple Watch from day one where you can open the camera on the Apple Watch. You can see what's on the iPhone camera. And so you can take a picture or start a video from your Apple Watch, and you can see what it looks like, and you can use the good camera on the iPhone rather than the FaceTime or front side camera, and you could see it right there. It was some revelation, I guess, recently <laughs> that, you know, it's a great tool for vloggers who want to use the back camera on the iPhone, which is the better quality camera system, and still be able to see what it's seeing without having to go around and look at it all the time. And using the Apple Watch for that is a great tool. And I've done it in the past for recording little videos here and there. And you can start the video on your Apple Watch and you can see that it's still recording. You see the preview image right there. And it's a great way if you only have an iPhone and you have an Apple Watch and you want to do a vlogging type video. Yeah, it's a great feature for that. Apparently, this is like some new revelation and it's like it was huge all over the Internet. But then you saw some other things, products that are developed just for this purpose. So <laughs> tell me what you saw. Yeah, I saw some accessories that you could buy, uh, specifically a tripod mount for your Apple Watch, which is kind of hilarious. It goes to show that someone somewhere has thought of this before. <laughs> it'll it'll be in the show notes, but it's it, it, it's quite hilarious. I don't, I don't know how um, useful it is. Uh, you're going to be popping your Apple Watch in and out of this thing. I kind of like the idea of people just kind of throwing their Apple Watch band over the phone. <laughs> I think someone uh, commented on Twitter on this on this story saying, I, "Now I need a." really long watch strap so i can strap my watch vertically across the phone too for portrait uh video and it's just <laughs> pretty wild stuff but i don't know if i would ever do this uh there's there's another um thing i wanted to mention that for like bloggers who do this stuff obviously you're probably aware of filmic mm -hmm. pro and uh, other camera apps like that but you can actually set it up so that your ipad is controlling the camera on another device you can actually have remote control from maybe right in front of you while you're filming and see your position. But, you know, you probably don't want to be looking down at the iPad to see, you know, where you are on the phone because uh, then you're looking down right. at the video. I think this is pretty clever. It gets your eyes towards the camera and uh, lets you see what's happening all at once. It, it At the very least, a, a tool using what you already have kind of deal. And uh, that's always nice when you don't have to blow extra money on something. This episode is brought to you by Smart Asset. No matter what stage of life you're in, thinking about your financial future can evoke some pretty strong feelings. Did you know that people who work with a financial advisor feel more at ease about their finances and end up with 15% more money to spend in retirement on average? Thanks to Smart Asset, the service that over half a million people have trusted to help find an advisor, there's a free and easy path to help you find greater financial peace of mind. Smart Asset has built a safe, easy, and convenient tool to find vetted financial advisors in your area. I'll have to say, during this whole time of the pandemic and an unknown future, 
I've wanted to invest more and not really sure how to do it. I want to make sure the financial future for myself and my family is secure. And doing it with a financial advisor just gives me confidence that I'm making the best decision possible. And I can trust that my money is going to be working for me. So stop wrestling with what you should do and how you should do it and take action today. Here's how it works. You begin by taking Smart Assets Short Quiz. Their quiz will really help you understand what are your goals and what are you trying to plan for. They'll ask how many years do you have until retirement, what activity is most important to you when you retire, how you currently manage your investments and finances. They really ask the right questions so they can understand your financial situation and recommend a great advisor to help you. They even ask questions about saving for college and your family. They really get a full picture of your financial situation. Then within minutes, Smart Asset will match you with three pre-screened fiduciaries, each legally obligated to act in your best interest and each willing to do a no-commitment financial consultation. They'll also send you a free personalized retirement planning guide with actionable advice so you can feel confident in your next steps. Take control of your financial future today with Smart Asset. To receive your free personalized retirement planning report, go to Smart asset.com slash apple insider that's smart a-s-s-e-t dot com slash apple insider your report will provide personalized insights on your retirement readiness so visit smart asset.com slash apple insider today our thanks to smart asset for sponsoring this episode so as i was editing video on my m1 macbook pro i had the realization and the thought of, I want to be able to just use this all the time, both at a desk and wherever I'm sitting on the sofa or just traveling or wherever. And so I started investigating the options for docking the M1 MacBook Pro and using a monitor. And so we come to trying to find a good monitor to use with your MacBook or iPad. And this was also Marco Arment on ATP. He was talking about how he sold his iMac Pro and is now full-time on the M1 MacBook Air because what he does in Xcode and developing of Overcast that he just finds it actually does things way faster than his iMac Pro. And so he is doing this as well. And he's connecting it to a monitor and using it docked at a desk or just by itself when traveling. Now, he has thoughts about the LG Ultrafine display, also explains that if you want that retina quality 5K resolution, that the LG Ultrafine is kind of one of the only choices, but it is like 1300 bucks if you want to get the LG Ultrafine 5K brand new. So I was trying to find and asking Twitter, someone tell me a better option and uh, the only one you mentioned was the Pro XDR. Thanks a lot, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, big <laughs> yeah, help. Big, big yes. help. I was not going XDR. You know, I was looking for LG Ultrafine as a max price point. So I, I got the Bridge Vertical Dock, which I'm excited about that. I've, I've never had one. But the Bridge Vertical Dock, it's made for your size MacBook Air or MacBook Pro. You put it in vertically, and it gives you those two Thunderbolt ports coming out of the Bridge Dock. One, ideally, to a monitor, and then one maybe to, like, a Thunderbolt 3 dock where you can plug in a bunch of stuff. So I got that. That's coming. But I just I could not decide what monitor to go with. Well, I wanted to ask about that dock. I know you haven't got it yet, but when you do, try and mention um, how it is putting your MacBook in and out of it. Because I, I, I've always wondered that, like, is it a struggle trying to align the ports? Are you uh, having to, is it a two-handed operation removing it? Or are you pushing down on the dock to remove the thing? It's just kind of a curious concept of, you know, you're sliding your aluminum MacBook into this thing trying to align the ports properly. Uh, it, it just seems like a very focused task anyway. But I mean, not that it's cumbersome. I I like the idea of having uh, everything run through a dock as well, but it's just kind of funny thinking like, okay, I just want my MacBook to stick up in midair and on the in the center of my desk. I guess it looks cool, <laughs> but it, it just... Yeah, and I've, I've seen one or two used in like a co-working space that I'm at. Bridge really promotes that it's precision engineered where it just slides directly into those ports. And I'm, I'm a little leery because like you can't really see it connect. Like the vertical bridge dock, it's not transparent and everything's like inside this like little padded thing. So you just drop your MacBook Pro in there in faith. <laughs> so These are the guys that make the bridge keyboards for the iPad, right? Yes, same company. Yeah, they, they do a pretty good job at precision engineering for Apple products. I'll give them that. The uh, bridge keyboards before the Magic Keyboard came along, sorry guys, but <laughs> before that came along, their keyboard was the go-to perfect 
keyboard. Um, I loved that thing. And I just, I hate that if they could re revolutionize keyboards again and just one up Apple's magic keyboard somehow, I would go running back to them because they have really good yeah. engineering. But yeah, that magic keyboard's kind of just perfect. Yeah. And that's, that's why I went with Bridge. I knew their engineering and precision quality was really top notch. So I will see, I will for sure explain how that experience is, but I got the vertical dock. I also heard from Marco Arment that clamshell mode on an M1 Mac is almost flawless. And that's something where if you don't know what that is or haven't used it before, is if you connect your MacBook, MacBook Pro to an external monitor and it's plugged into power, whether that power is coming from the monitor over USB-C or you also have the other port plugged in, that you can close the MacBook lid, close the screen, so the computer is totally closed. Normally, that would put it to sleep, but you can use the computer like normal on the monitor and you know, the MacBook is, is shut. And that's what the vertical dock from Bridge is meant to do. Right. And then you're only using the monitor and it's basically like you have a desktop computer and not a laptop. And in the past on Intel MacBooks and MacBook Pros, I've tried this, I've tried Luna Display, I've tried all the other apps and even hardwired, like even just doing directly to a monitor and into power, clamshell mode can be a little finicky, especially when using Bluetooth keyboards, a magic mouse over Bluetooth, and it just intermittent connectivity issues and all that. So I've avoided trying to do clamshell mode or really even using my MacBook Pro laptops as, you know, that kind of docked thing. But as Marco was saying, the M1 MacBook Pro clamshell mode is like amazing. And one of the things that affects clamshell mode is like the ability to change display resolutions and how quickly it does that. And if you have an Intel Mac, you know that even if you go to system preferences and displays, and you change the scaling or the resolution of your screen, you know, it goes black, all the windows look funny for a second, and then it snaps into place. On the M1 Mac, you don't need an external monitor to do this, but you can go to system preferences, displays, change the resolution or the scaling, and it changes like instantly. No latency, you don't see the screen refresh at all, it's just instant. And so I think with that capability for changing resolutions, clamshell mode seems to be more solid on the M1. So I'm curious to try that, and if it really works well, Maybe when a more powerful MacBook Pro will upgrade to that, but maybe I don't need an iMac or any kind of desktop and I could just do everything on an M1 laptop and best of both worlds. Dock it, feels like a desktop at a desk, take it with you and you have a laptop everywhere else. So you need a monitor for that. And so I was looking far and wide. You're now running into the same problem I ran into last year. So you were in the exact same boat I was in January, February of last year. And I said, you know what? The ultra fines are great, but there has to be some other monitor on the planet that offers Apple like experience with, you know, less price. It, it, it's just unfathomable <laughs> to me to, that manufacturers hadn't targeted this market at all. And I spent weeks upon weeks looking at monitors. I even ordered one and had to return it just because it was a, a utter failure. But I, I just want to know your experience researching this so far. Yeah. So it was a challenge because again, like I had the same, I had the same thought that you did, meaning like surely there has to be another option out there that's decent. Now, if you're looking just for 4k, which you can get the LG ultra fine in a 4k model, just looking for 4k models is you have a little more options there. If you really want the retina 5k look, the LG Ultrafine is really one of the only ones that offers that. If you want the bigger size screen at 5K, get that retina type resolution, that's kind of the only one. Looking at 4K options in the lower price range, you know, I went to Wirecutter, I found some other articles recommending monitors, and really you have some other LG models, and then you have like the Dell Ultra Sharps, and you can get one that has USB C connectivity. Very hard, if not impossible, to find Thunderbolt 3 connectivity. And all the other monitors, one of the things that drove me nuts is like all the ports that I would not use on these monitors. Right. If you go to like the Dell Ultra Sharps or even some of the other models in the LG line, you're going to get like a display port, an HDMI, a USB A, a headphone jack, and a USB C. Just for my, like, it would bother me just knowing, like, all those ports are back there and I'm not using them. Like, I don't want that. I wanted all USB-C or Thunderbolt ports, which is what the LG Ultrafine gives you. And the other thing is, if I'm going to be editing more video and photography and doing that kind of stuff, I want a monitor that's high quality. And it is tough to find. Yeah, I wanted to be extra picky. I said, you know what? I, I'm not going to spend the money unless it's something that I really want. So I even said, I want the P3 color gamut 98%. I want 
4K resolution. I want the exact experience I'm getting from this 4K ultra fine. I, I originally used the 21 and a half inch 4K ultra fine, whatever the first generation one was uh, mm -hmm. that got interrupted by routers. Really like that monitor. Luckily, I never had any issues, but uh, I really like that monitor. I still have it. It's in my living room connected to a Mac mini. I turn on twice a month, but the thing I like the most is that I could plug in the iPad to the, the Thunderbolt port and then use the additional uh, ports in the back to connect what have you. And that was great. I wasn't quite enough ports. I still needed a dock to use with it, but it was nice that the monitor offered additional options and it was all communicating through that one line. Nothing else I could find offered similar connectivity. And if it did, it was very expensive. So I kind of gave up and said, you know, what if I do all the smarts in a dock and just have a dumb monitor? I ended up ordering first, I think it was one of the Dells. It was very nice, uh, pretty much borderless display, much better looking than the the fat, ugly, ultra fine. And right. the thing got here. And uh, remember, listeners, I'm on an iPad, not a Mac. I plug my iPad into it. The black bars are on the sides. Not only am I dealing with that, it's letterbox too. <laughs> there was a black bar at the top and bottom, and I had no idea why. No settings would fix this. Ugh. Nothing worked. It was just a box in a box. And uh, I felt like I was looking through a window at my iPad screen, and it just didn't make any sense to use this. So I returned it immediately. <laughs> Luckily, I, I bought this from Best Buy so I could just drive right. up the street and drop it off. But that was lesson learned. Not everything's going to work the way, the way you think it's going to. So months and months later, that, that must have been in May, keep researching it knowing like I'm, I'm not going to give up. And I find out that LG is actually coming out with a new line of monitors specific to gaming but they also have a higher refresh rate, offer HDMI and DisplayPort, no, no USB or Thunderbolt connection, but I figured I could make without. Um, you probably, you definitely need the Thunderbolt connection, obviously, but I could uh, fudge it a little bit and ended up with the LG gaming monitor. It doesn't really have a name. It's one of those numbers and characters, 27 GN 950 B something. It's great. 27 inches perfectly fits in my little desk. And it has this cool backlight effect where it's shooting color out of the uh, LEDs out of the back of the monitor. Have no control over that because again, I don't have software and I believe the software is windows only <laughs> anyway. So I'll be reviewing this at some point. I've had it forever, but it's on the to do list. Uh, keep an eye out for it on Apple Insider, but it's a nice monitor and it does pretty much what I needed it to, to uh, be a significant upgrade from the LG. So I'll put, there'll be a link in show notes to this, of course, but so you connect to it HDMI? I can, but it turns out not, it's not as nice. Uh, I use the display oh. port. So we'll mention later, I have the uh, HyperDrive 12 in one dock and I'm using the display port option to connect to it through that. Okay. So that's what you ended up with. It's currently out of stock on LG's website, apparently. So maybe it's popular, but <laughs> I'll put a link and show notes to it anyway. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now, I don't know about you, but when I use a public restroom, I like to close the door behind me. I don't want people looking in on me, and I imagine you feel the same way. So why would you let people look in on you when you go and browse the internet? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom not closing the door. Did you know that your internet service provider, whether that's Spectrum, Comcast, or Verizon, they know about every single website you visit. And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. That's why when you see those creepy ads, whether it's on social media or on the internet, and they seem extremely targeted to exactly you, that's because your data is being used and sold to those ad companies. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices. It works on my iPhone, iPad, my MacBook. It even works on some smart TVs and Wi-Fi routers. So if you want to make sure that all the activity in your home is protected and private, you can put ExpressVPN on that router and then you know every device in your home is browsing securely. And the best part is ExpressVPN is as easy as closing a door. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by CNET, Wired, The Verge, and many others. So if you're like me and you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider today. Use our exclusive link, EXPRESSVPN dot com slash Apple Insider, and you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider. Our thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. So as I was searching, 
I I did not want to spend the full amount on the ultra fines because, like you said, the ultra fine doesn't also like look great bezel wise. Like it has a really thick bezel. It does have a webcam in it, which is why the top bezel is extra thick, or at least on the five K model. I was gonna say the newer ones or the five K one does. The older ones do not. Right. Yeah. The newer ones has the camera. So like, especially if you go with the five K larger one, like it is a lot of bezel. It doesn't look great. And some of those Dell. Ultra Sharps and other LGs like have really thin bezels, almost no bezels. And so that was attractive. But again, the connectivity and quality of the monitor and all that kind of stuff, I just wasn't sure. So didn't want to spend the full amount. Right now you can buy them new, the 4K for $700 and the LG Ultra Fine 5K for $1,300. Didn't want to do that. So I went to Amazon and they do have renewed 4K Ultra Fine displays for $600 some as low as $550. These are renewed, not new, but you could save $100 to $150 on them. And because I did all my holiday shopping on Amazon with my Amazon card, I had like $100 of Amazon points plus a gift card. So I was able to get that even farther down. And so I actually went with a renewed ultra fine LG 4K display and it comes in a couple of days. So I'm going to try it with the bridge dock and see how it goes. I think you'll like it. I mean, it really is. It's the best display you can get uh, in the Apple ecosystem. And that's really sad to say because Apple really should be making monitors or somebody. But it's it's the best one you can get that does everything you need it to do. I don't need that one, obviously. Yes. Uh, w- what size is that? 24 inches? I believe it is 24. Yes. Yeah. See, that that was my thing too. I, I thought about what if I just get the next generation from the, you know, the second generation LG Ultrafine, because that goes from 21 right. and a half to 24, just wasn't quite enough. I wanted the 27 inch because I'd measured my desk and knew that would fit like exactly inside of my desk uh, alcove thing. Yeah. It's, it's just wild to me that LG is pretty much the only manufacturer that's targeting this market. I mean, Dell has a couple of monitors that almost fit the bill, but it's none of them are quite what you want. And I've definitely been spoiled by using the ultra fines. Yeah. And we are not the first to say this, but it would be wonderful if Apple went back to making that like mid range, high quality monitor, just take the panels they use in the IMAX, the 4k and 5k IMAX, put it in a Apple like frame that looks nice with some Thunderbolt connections on the back and be done with it and sell it for whatever, like 1500 even. But to have some kind of Apple first option that's not an LG Ultrafine, that looks more like an Apple product and is also not $6,000 with the stand, like the Pro Display XDR. Right. Consensus seems to be that if Apple does anything in the monitor market, we're talking about two grand, a $2,000 monitor. And that's not great. It's better than doubling that and not getting a stand with right. it, you know <laughs> i'm just not i'm just not in the market for professional grade uh media I, I i shoot a video twice a month you know it's it's not something i'm thinking about very often and i mean while i do want improved color accuracy and stuff for my photo work it's just not five thousand dollars worth of work you know what i mean yeah you know, exactly Listeners, if you have some kind of docking setup or monitor you love, we would love to hear about it. Tweet at us, maybe take a picture of your setup, or if you have the LG Ultrafine and you just absolutely love it. Yeah, I'd love to hear that too. And also, not only the monitor you're using, but if you use your MacBook or MacBook Pro in clamshell mode or docked mode and you have a dock, I'd love to know what people are using. I have some experience with the OWC docks and the Anchor docks as well as Hyper. I have some of all those in varying levels of connectivity. You know, you can get them all the way up to like, you know, what, 18 different ports. And I don't need that, but I would like another Thunderbolt port from the dock, the Ethernet SD card, and some USB-As. Curious what you guys use out there. Right now, actually, as we talk, I'm using one of the Anchor ones. This is a smaller one. Uh, It has a cable coming out that's like connected to the thing. I think it's the seven in one, but I really want ethernet on whatever I'm using and an SD card and USB-A. That's kind of like the non-negotiables. So again, listeners, tell me what you're using, what dock you would recommend. I know CalDigit makes them, Bridge also makes some docks. Again, I've had good luck with Anchor and Hyper, but 
Let me know what you use. But Wes, you have one of these that you use with your iPad, right? Yeah, I use the uh, Hyper 12-in-1. It's um, a little bit overkill for the iPad. I think I mentioned it on here before. It has three or four monitor inputs. out of the So the, out of the 12, I'm only really effectively using nine because I can only have one monitor with my iPad. And I mean, the same would go for you if you have an M1 right. Mac. You can only connect to one external monitor, even if you're using a dock. So I don't think that's a waste. It's, it's fine. Maybe in the future, the iPad will get multiple monitor support who knows but i'm not crying about it um the other nine ports serve the purpose and it's not too expensive compared to other docks in its class i've noticed some weirdness and this uh, this again might just be an ipad thing every now and then i'll be running this dock and it's just like well your mouse doesn't want to work anymore Uh, (laughs) and it's it's very rare but it's the to solve it it's unplug and replug in the usb port on the ipad and then you know it's fine right that's just the usual headache i it could be a beta thing it could be an ipad thing i have too many weirdness things going on for me to be able to even target where the issue is coming from but yeah nothing with the dock i don't think it's it's pretty solid big it's aluminum i think it's heat sink cooled i don't think it has a fan in it some of these do have fans so keep that in mind when shopping you don't want to add 15 more fans to your desk i wanted to note one thing uh monitor wise just one last thing the lg ultrafine i noticed when i use it with my ipad you get power through to charge your ipad with so it's nice to leave it plugged in or whatever when you're not using it keep the ipad at 100 percent. but when you do that the monitor backlight comes on now the monitor doesn't always display something because if you lock the ipad screen it goes away but the monitor comes on and that always concerned me like am i Hmm. burning up anything in there um luckily the uh, lg display that i've purchased since has an on off Mm. switch which the ultra fines do not funny enough so just wanted to note that one but dock wise the hyper seems to be pretty good it's not huge it's thick but it's about the size of an iphone um lengthwise widthwise pretty good little guy to just have sitting on your desk Mm -hmm. i have ethernet usb ports uh so my keyboard and mouse are hardwired in the microphone's hardwired in that i'm using right now and uh works pretty well all right well listeners let us know tweet at me tweet at wes and email us what are you using all right so now we enter what's coming in 2021 some of the rumors that have been coming obviously wes and i probably especially looking for the new ipad pro that might be coming out in 2021. Again, the 2020 model, it was refreshed, got the 12Z processor and the LiDAR scanner, but not a ton different. I'm hoping that big changes are coming in 2021 to the iPad Pro. There is the rumor that it'll be mini LED. That'll be early this year. Apple usually releases around March for the new iPad Pro. But I know you got the 12Z 2020 model. I'm still rocking the 2018. I know I'll be upgrading day one when the new iPad Pro is announced and released. Are you looking forward to this? Are you going to upgrade again? I'll, I'll definitely upgrade. I mean, I've <laughs> been um, looking at the iPad lately, writing about it and just thinking, why did I buy the yeah. uh, 2021? <laughs> but not that it's a bad thing. Like I've, I've enjoyed right. this. Um, I had the 2018 model with one terabyte of memory. So I had six gigs of RAM anyway. So I was sitting here thinking, why Why did I upgrade? But I think at the time I saw like, oh, better Wi-Fi speeds, better 4G speed. So I, I bought an LT connected iPad Pro because sometimes I think, oh, I'll, I'll be working on the go. I travel a lot. I do a lot of convention stuff. This was what, yeah. March when this thing came out? So I, I still thought the world existed when I purchased this thing. And um, there was some of that going into upgrading to this one. So I don't I don't regret it, but the world certainly didn't help uh, the purchase decision afterwards, obviously. <laughs> sure. Didn't get to didn't get to use the LTE as much as I thought I was going to anyway. Right. When the mini LED one launches, I will definitely be upgrading. But I wanted to note that I don't expect it as soon as everyone else is. Now, you know, coming from nobody me, I, I don't have any insider information or anything, but iPads are on 18 month release cycles. I'm still putting my money on fall 2021. It seems that a couple of other leakers might be thinking the same way. So oh, we'll, we'll man. see. I would. I really hope I don't have to wait that long, only because I edit my podcast on the iPad Pro, and the battery life has actually taken a major hit recently. Where wow. I need to make sure it's at 100 percent when I start editing the Apple Insider podcast, and by the time I'm exporting that final MP3, I'm in like the single digit percentage, depending on how long the episode is. But it is really noticeable the degrading battery life when I'm doing something processor intensive, like using ferrite, editing the podcast and all that. So 
one of the main reasons I want to upgrade is for battery life. Well, that's interesting that this is an iPad. Is this a 12.9 inch? It's the, it's the 11 inch. Okay. Cause I was wondering, cause um, I mean, we're talking close to three years now. Sure. That, that makes sense for uh, a battery that size. If it was the 12.9 inch, I'd be concerned for something else, but no, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, I enjoy the 11 inch size, but now noticing the battery degradation at this point has me thinking, do I want to go larger in the next iPad I get? which I now have the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro. You know, I used to have the 16-inch. So for me, it was like, I have a large laptop, small iPad, works out great. Now I have a 13-inch MacBook. And I don't know if I want to get a almost 13-inch iPad and basically have the same screen size device. I mean, it's right. very different use cases. They are differentiated. But I like the idea of having a smaller iPad, even smaller than the 13-inch MacBook Pro I have, just for portability. I like editing my podcast just sitting on a sofa or in a comfortable chair and doing it with the Apple Pencil. And the size is just great. But yeah, the battery life is is really noticeable. So I don't know. I'll have to see when and if the new one comes out. Hopefully March rather than fall. But but we'll see. Worst case, when it comes to these things, batteries, they, they can always be replaced. And uh, I don't think it's that expensive for an iPad. It's still money, but um, True. it's doable. I mean, I personally would never, I couldn't do that. Have a 13-inch laptop and <laughs> iPad, it would feel way too redundant. I would yeah. either need, if I buy a Mac in the future, it's going to be a desktop iMac with a big 27-inch screen. And that's 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 my future plans right now. Even though I don't really use them, it's nice to have a Mac line around somewhere uh, that's modern. So that's that's my next purchase plan as far as a Mac goes. But yeah, I wouldn't buy a 13-inch MacBook. That's, that's mostly why I haven't jumped on the M1 train because I don't need a, another Mac mini I already have one running in a closet and I don't need a 13 inch MacBook because my life is on my iPad the 11 inch size class is nice I agree like I'm using that iPad air right that just got released as my like day-to-day iPad kind of thing because iPad pro is great it's my laptop iPad it's on my desk it's in a keyboard usually I very rarely pop it out and use it as a tablet when I want to use a tablet I go to the iPad air and uh, so I'll, I'll agree with you that portability in that size class is just uh it's the sweet spot when it comes to these things so if I were you I would stick with the 11 inch personally yeah that's just me getting back to the uh mini LED iPads that we're talking about. The reason why I mentioned why it might come later is um, we've seen a little bit of chatter on this. Uh, John Prosser has been talking about it on Twitter as he usually does. He said March, but love to dream. Uh, the other le- leaker that we keep an eye on put a question mark as a retweet. And of course the usual cryptic <laughs> messaging from them, just a question mark uh, on, on the March uh, suggestion right. from Prosser. But I am going to side with Love Dream here. I don't see it happening again with no information on my part, but the fall really just feels like this is where that's going to happen. Killing me, Wes. Killing me. I was really hoping <laughs> for that annual release cycle. We'll see. It does look like that it'll be a pretty significant upgrade, though. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be great. I, I actually may look into the battery replacement and how much that costs. I'm, I never even thought about that for an iPad. I know iPhone stuff and even for the AirPods and Macs, Apple was saying they have a program for that, but yeah, I'll have to see about the iPad. You might be within the two year mark. And if you can prove degradation, they might do it for free, Mm -hmm. but that's just, you know, you'll have to go to an Apple store and do all that mess. I don't think you, can you see your battery health on an iPad? I have never checked. Now that you ask, we can do some uh, real time follow-up. It does not tell me. It doesn't tell me my battery health. Yeah. I didn't expect it. I mean, iPads having much larger batteries. I don't think Apple is too worried about telling customers about it. These are devices people upgrade so rarely that the battery shouldn't be an issue. But again, I guess your heavy use might have played a factor into this too. Yeah, and I I only notice it when I'm editing the podcast. You know, if I'm watching something or if I'm just using it for emails and web browsing, it lasts all day. The battery's fine. It's really just in that processor intensive tasks. And for me, that's only podcasting. It's just when I get to the place where I may have to find a charger before I'm done editing a podcast, like that's really, that's, it really kind of grates on me. And it's like the whole reason why I, I do it because I enjoy editing it on there with the Apple Pencil more than on a Mac, first and foremost. But second of all is that I can do it sitting anywhere on a chair, on a sofa, and, you know, just enjoy where I'm at editing it. And I have to find a plug in the middle of editing a podcast. Like that, that was not a great experience. So we'll see. So the, um, next iPad Pro, we're looking at mini LED, which is the LEDs are just much smaller. So they are going to be able to uh, 
shine light through those in much more targeted areas. It's going to be similar to how OLED works, but less efficient, but on a bigger screen that shouldn't matter. So we're going to see better blacks, better color representation on these tablets, but the even bigger upgrade is going to be the move to the A14 series right. processors, probably A14X in the um, new iPads. And that's exciting. Yeah, that, that's what I'm excited for because that will help both battery life if the processor is faster and can process with less power, but still just as much. That would be great. So looking forward to it. I wonder if mini LED will affect Apple Pencil accuracy as well. Maybe we'll see a couple of milliseconds gained on that too. That is true. This episode is brought to you by Remote HQ. As you know, we're still in this time where there's many people working from home, and that's probably going to continue for the foreseeable future. So if you work with a team and coworkers, you need a tool where you can collaborate and do conference calls that's rock solid and has all the features so you feel like you're in the room together. That's why I recommend Remote HQ. Remote HQ is a way where you can conference call via video, share screen, collaborate on different documents and apps, and it is rock solid. And I love that you don't even have to download an app. You just run it in the web browser and it works great. If you're on a creative team or you have clients and you like to be able to see a website or share Google Docs, their website co-branding and co-control is a great feature for you. You can take control of a website or you can give someone else so they can control and make comments. And you can turn any website instantly collaborative so multiple people can click, scroll, and type away. You can also customize the workspace, whether you want people's videos on one side, you want to share doc here or collaborate on a website in a larger part of the screen. You can customize that workspace and then save that layout for the next time you have a meeting. One of my favorite features is the searchable digital trail. This means that as you have meetings and collaboration sessions, if you take notes and annotations and remarks on things, you can save that note in the meeting and then you can go back and search through all the notes from the meetings you've had and find either that point or that task or whatever it is that you were talking about and you can remember what was discussed. And again, there's no software download required so you can collaborate with other people even if they're not as tech savvy and you don't want to have to worry about them downloading some app. This works right in the web browser. So whether you work on a team, maybe you lead a team or you work with clients and you need a rock solid collaboration tool that gives you that video conferencing capability as well, definitely check out Remote HQ. Go to remotehq.co slash Apple Insider for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the promo code Apple Insider, all one word, for three months free. That's remotehq.co slash Apple Insider. Our thanks to Remote HQ for sponsoring this episode. I wanted to touch on some LiDAR use cases. And as you know, LiDAR is now on the iPhone 12 Pro line. Apple is using it for focusing in low light when you take pictures. But was, I've been curious, what are other companies going to do? Obviously, furniture like Ikea and stuff uses AR. Don't think they're using the LiDAR sensor on the phone just yet for some of those apps. I'm not positive. But one of the use cases that just came out now is, of course, TikTok, the social media platform that's just blowing up, used it for one of their filters. They used it for a 2021 like New Year type filter. And when this filter goes off, it's using the LiDAR scanner and confetti drops from the top part of the video. And the confetti actually falls on objects around the room. So in this example, I'll put the link to the article in show notes, but you can see the confetti like laying on the sofa as though it's like literally just landing on those objects and then landing on the floor. You see it like it looks pretty real, just kind of like laying there, obviously just for fun. But really cool use case, and you can really see the power of the LiDAR scanner in the accuracy of these augmented reality things. And then also this article that we have, William actually wrote it talking about Apple using AR and other things in the future, namely personal shopping help and even tech support. And when I read the tech support thing, I don't know why I had not thought of that before, but what an awesome use case where if you have an issue with your Mac or an iPad and you have your iPhone with LiDAR, for someone to be able to, you could send your whatever, your video, your FaceTime, you know, some kind of app, maybe the Apple support app would do it. But where someone who's trying to help you with your Mac, basically just have your phone point at the computer and an AR, they can kind of show you like click here or do this or explain like, oh, this is what this means on screen and using that AR to really help someone show where it is. Obviously, the LiDAR wouldn't work on a flat screen, but if someone had needed help with 
connecting things to their computer or even kind of more advanced help if someone's using a Mac Pro with like video type connections and SDI and all those other kind of things that someone could, you know, literally walk you through with augmented reality showing exactly what to touch or what cable to pull. Yeah, pretty wild use cases that could come in the future. So I'll put that link to that article as well in show notes. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, we've seen some applications in the real world um, using augmented reality or this borderlines on something called mixed reality because augmented reality is kind of a kind of dumb. It's you're literally overlaying digital images over the real world usually doesn't have any awareness of the world it's being overlaid on it's just there say pokemon go usually if you're playing pokemon go if you've had this experience and go in the ar mode the pokemon rarely is ever standing on the ground right. it's kind of hovering in midair or sitting on a wall it's because the phone has no awareness it's not giving the, the app or the game any information saying that's a wall and that's a floor it's just that's a flat surface and that's really all it gets uh, mixed reality and something that lidar is going to enable and apple's just probably going to continue calling it ar because it's you know marketing but um that's where it has more awareness of the uh, area around it so that's what tiktok's taking advantage of it's able to acknowledge that there are multiple surfaces in the room and uh use that filter to uh land, have the confetti land on the furniture and stuff yeah. if you've paid attention to the microsoft hololens which <laughs> will never exist in real life they're concepts are really cool they've shown mechanics building motorcycles wearing the hollow lens somehow if they're not blinded by it but it shows them instructions on you know where does the part go or they've even shown like surgeons which that's just terrifying to me but showing <laughs> surgeons using it in surgery to uh, label things that they're supposed to be doing and i don't see that ever happening and you know i mean they're obviously testing it and these are test beds but at least from you know the consumer perspective we can see more of that happening like like you said connect this wire here to you know set up your surround sound or something yeah yeah that would be cool so i did want to point out andrew reviewed the belkin magsafe three and one charger this was announced close to if not the same day as the apple magsafe announcement did apple actually mention this in the event think they mentioned belkin I, there was like a splash on the screen like we've already partnered with some of our people to make stuff right i think it showed the car adapter i'm not sure if it showed the right. three-in-one charging station well this is the three-in-one long awaited because it was announced early on so it's been a number of months but this has the magsafe charger for an iphone a charging puck for an apple watch and a like base plate where you can put the airpods on andrew reviewed it and he's got a video andrew gave it a five stars so five stars for this review for the Belkin 3-in-1 MagSafe. So he's, you know, thinks very highly of it. Its availability is still unknown. There was kind of some conflict between one Belkin representative saying it's delayed till February, another saying, no, 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 it's going to be available at apple.com starting January 8th today, if you listen to this the day this comes out. So unknown exactly when it will be available. Obviously, you'll know if it did come out on the 8th right now. You can see it on Belkin's website and the be notified when available button is there if you want to give them your email address. But I'm excited to try it at 150 bucks. It is extremely competitive with the MagSafe Duo charger from Apple and looks like this will also be more durable. Not as compact because it is like this stem that comes out and it'll be much taller. The iPhone does kind of float there. So hopefully the magnet is strong enough to hold it there. It looks great. Are you going to be getting one of these? Um, well, I'm, I'm considering it. My current bedside table, so I, I keep changing these things around because new technologies. I've For the longest time, I've used the Nomad uh, right. charger with the the big leather pad and an Apple watch so I could charge the phone, the AirPods and all that at once. I've moved from that and that's on um, my dresser across the room now. And it, that's usually just where I top off my Apple watch and maybe my AirPods, but my phone very rarely finds it at my bedside table. Now I have the Saitechi MagSafe uh, clone. It charges at 7.5 Watts, but it's an overnight charger. So I don't care about right. the speed or, you know, uh, the charging intensity, but that's been nice because it's a longer cable. So it's MagSafe. I can pick it up. The cable's still attached. I can look at my phone and lay it back down on the dresser and that's fine. This would be a change. It'd be on the nightstand, but now that it's MagSafe, pop the phone off, look at it, pop it back on. It all aligns with magnets. Seems like it's a much better experience than other nightstand chargers when using just regular QI charging and you're in the dark fumbling around trying to figure out where the iPhone is, feel it vibrate and hope that hope that it doesn't fall off the charger at some point in the night and not charge at all. So right. this definitely seems like an improvement. Yeah, for sure. We'll touch on these last things briefly, but 
the whole privacy conversation is going to be a big deal in 2021. Obviously, the privacy nutrition labels came out recently. Apps are updating, and we can see all the information it's taking, looking at you, Facebook. Google, strangely, has not updated their app, and they would be required to do the privacy nutrition label on the next update. Google said they're going to be updating it this week. Haven't seen it yet, but be curious to know what information Google is also taking with their Google apps on iPhone. But Facebook is still talking about how you know, Apple's privacy features are hurting their business. You know, they took out those full page ads in the newspapers last month. Again, this is just gonna be an ongoing conversation. Again, hilarious how Facebook is framing this. I don't know if you saw this, but Franklin Graham, you know, the late Billy Graham's son actually posted on Facebook defending Facebook and how it is one of the main it's this huge benefit connecting family and friends and how it is valuable to businesses and all this kind of stuff. And I was just so surprised to see support even from a hyper conservative side. I just don't know if people understand the ramifications of how and what Facebook is taking data wise and how that this framing or Facebook is saying that like Apple's going to hurt small businesses and people's mentality that Facebook is really the only way to connect with other people or get information out about your business. It's just a, a wild framing of this whole situation. And so this is going to be an ongoing conversation throughout the year for sure. But this whole thing is just, it's kind of irritating. I, most people don't care. I would, I would bet, you know, up more than 50% or even don't care unaware. They just want their social network. They just want their, their likes and their retweets or whatever. So Facebook has basically come out and said, we give up more or less the the full page ads didn't seem to do anything they came out with a bunch of marketing gear w with like pre-made stickers and and images that businesses could make and say we stand with facebook and small businesses and it, it's just a, a whole a big farce and uh this this final i hope final I, I doubt it but this thing from facebook says apple's changes will benefit them while hurting the industry and the ability for businesses of all sizes to market themselves efficiently and grow through personalized advertising. We believe that personalized ads and user privacy can coexist, which is true, <laughs> except that like um, their personalized ads need to know everything, which isn't the case. I mean, I, I've mentioned before, they, need, they, they have way too much data for what they're trying to offer. Uh, generalized billboards have worked for dozens of years and Facebook's over here saying, no, 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 that's awful. It'll never work. But anyway, I digress. The story here is, is basically, if you've kept up with this at all, the companies that Facebook approached to speak out against Apple all basically said, no, we make money by selling products. <laughs> we only use you to advertise. <laughs> you bring us customers and they pay us money. So... The only thing that these businesses are saying is we don't we don't understand the the problem here. Uh, you're not really our business. You're not the reason why we make money. Yes, some customers come here through you, but you know there's also word of mouth campaigns. There's other ways to advertise, and uh, I I think Facebook's just kind of throwing up their arms here and just saying, "Yep, we give up." Uh, the title of the article is is. Facebook says it has no choice but to comply with Apple privacy feature. So they've effectively given up, it seems. Yeah. Well, and I'm, we'll have to see. We'll see what Google does. And as this conversation continues this year, Epic is still floating out there. I think that case happens in May, the whole Epic versus Apple actual legal court case. So we'll see what happens then. But just one last thing. What do you think about the uh, conspiracy theory around the Google privacy updates floating around? So there's there's two sides to this. One side is Google has postponed updating their apps because they're afraid. And uh, people have pointed out that the Android apps have all been updated, but the Apple apps have not since Apple's uh, thing has come out. And a few developers have stepped forward and say, um, no, Google just doesn't update anything the first two weeks of January. Um, what, do you th what do you think of that? Do you think Google's just trying to play hide and seek here or is this just an end of the year matter? It's a little weird because Google does update their apps very often for iOS, like all of their apps. And I do have the Gmail app on my iPhone and Google Drive and a couple other ones. So, you know, I see those updates come through pretty often. I don't want to read conspiracy just yet. I do think it's interesting that they felt they had to release a statement saying it is coming this week. So stop thinking it's a conspiracy, which immediately makes you think it's a conspiracy. <laughs> so right. um, I don't know. No conspiracies here. Look away. Yeah, exactly. I think it'll come to fruition like when they actually update it and we can see the privacy nutrition label. And if it is the comically long encyclopedia type nutrition label that Facebook has, that'll be interesting because I would have assumed that Google does not take as much information as Facebook from an iOS app. 
but I could be wrong. I'm of the opposite opinion. I I, I feel like it. Like what what else do we expect? It, it it's I, sure maybe they're not as comprehensive, but it'll be very nearly the same amount of data. It's everything that they can get maybe minus a few things because facebook really does just every single indicator is checked off (laughs) but um google might be missing one or two of those but it's still going to be a multi-page report i don't know why people expect it to be like oh google collects very little if no data it's surprising how little data (laughs) they collect it's it's not going to be that no it definitely won't be that but we'll we'll have to do like a a race to the bottom between Facebook and Google's privacy nutrition label. Let's <laughs> see, see which one ends first. Well, listeners, we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at both Wes and myself. Our Twitter handles are in show notes. You can email us. That link is also in show notes. If you missed it, we did a 2020 year in review. Me and special guest Jason A10 last week. That is the last episode in your feed. If you haven't yet, we would greatly appreciate a new five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts to start 2021 off right. I'll put a link to Apple Podcasts right there in show notes so you can go there and leave us a five-star rating. Don't forget to check out the Apple Insider Daily Show. It comes out every morning. And HomeKit Insider comes out every Monday with all the smart home and HomeKit news. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time.